Hey guys, what's up? Tiger Arcade here. Today, we got something special planned for you. We're gonna be going over some of these instruments right here, which are called oscilloscopes, and why they could be beneficial for us when using synthesizers. In addition, if you stick through this to the end, we're gonna be doing a Q&A to celebrate reaching 1,000 subscribers. So I just wanna thank you guys right now up front. I appreciate all your support that you've given me uh, since we started this little journey not too long ago. And I'm looking forward to what's next. It's all thanks to you guys, your support, and allowing me to continue to do what I love to do. And we're learning from each other as we do this. So should we get started? So, the first question we want to ask ourselves, what's an oscilloscope? Well, I might not be an encyclopedia, but I can at least give you a brief description of what one is. Basically, an oscilloscope is a way to view electrical signals. It's basically a graph. You can view how those signals look over time. They've come a long way throughout history. We've essentially been using oscilloscopes since the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it's changed a lot from going from having to hand draw, do measurements, calculations, you know, to essentially cathode ray tubes, which is this tank right here weighs over 50 pounds from the 1950s, basically all analog. Uh, an analog way of viewing electrical signals. It looks freaking awesome, but it's super dangerous if not used correctly. And then we have this little guy right here. I mean, <laughs> to say we've come a long way is putting it lightly. This is digital, and this thing is close to $50 when it's pre-built. This guy here was like industrial commercial grade and was like thousands of dollars. And I bought it for $25 uh, off of Facebook. So we've come a long way. And with synthesizers, you know, some companies are doing revolutionary things like Korg where they're actually built an oscilloscope right into their synth so you don't have to plug one in. Again, why would you want to use an oscilloscope with a synthesizer? Well, the number one thing is it's a great way to understand what your synth is doing internally. What those sounds look like that are coming out of it. Now, you can't do this with any synthesizer. This is more of a modular thing with control voltages and getting the right connections made to be able to display that correctly. So if you have something semi-modular, modular, this is right up your alley. If you don't, there are other means of still viewing what those waveforms look like. You can do it with a computer, but honestly, the easiest way is to really just buy something like this. I got this on Amazon. It was less than 50 bucks. You can even get ones that are not pre-built, and they're even cheaper. They're like... $20. So without further ado, let's give these guys a little test run and see what they look like and show you how you can do the same. Alright guys, so we're going to be using this little digital $50 synth here. Essentially, you can change the volts because synthesizers, when they send signals, don't quote me on this, but it's, it's between zero and and five volts for most synths. So we have to adjust the volts. You can adjust how frequent that signal is being displayed. Cause like I said, these will show you the frequency of the signals over time. So I have it on five milliseconds and you're gonna wanna use a BNC cable to 3.5 millimeter to plug it into your modular or semi-modular synth. So let's go ahead and get this connected. Okay. And I'm gonna be plugging it into the VCA output on my Mother 32. Okay, so let's get this thing going. So there's a little quirk I have to do where I'll press the volt button and then I have to adjust it to bring it down. I don't know why I have to do it, but I have to do it that way. 
But you can see here that I'm now getting signal, okay? So let's bring the camera in closer. We're on one volt. Um, you can adjust that if, if you'd like, but again, you don't need to go higher than five. So this is two, 500 millivolts, 100. I'm just kind of dropping it down so that I can observe the waveforms better, right? Now we'll do it by touching the keyboard here. So that's clearly sawtooth, right? Let's do square. And if we open it up with the pulse width, right? It's widening it. We're now getting a better visual of what this actually looks like. Look at that. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful square wave. We opened up the pulse width. We visualized it. This is sound design, guys. We're learning. You see that? So that's awesome. I want to show you what white noise is. It's, it's random. It's going to go all over the place. Check this out. It's like static you hear on a TV, right? Random. That's awesome. Now you can visualize it. See how it kind of zoom in there. I'm sure that's the wrong way to describe it. But guys, this is a cool way to view basically what the electrical signals are looking like, the waveforms. This is a great way to observe when doing sound design, to even just have an aesthetic, right, of seeing what it looks like when you play it. Uh, that's why I think the Korg Minilog is so cool because you always see that as you play and you fine-tune things. It, it really explains and helps you understand what's going on internally. Watch what happens when I do LFO. See that? Open and close. Square wave. So again, guys, this is something... You know, for pretty much any budget, it's, it's less than $50. And if you even want to build it yourself, it's like around $20. I'll leave a link to this for you guys to be able to get this yourself. Again, it's a great way to understand what your synths are looking like on the inside. All right, so we're on the last part now. I wanted to show you guys the beast from the 50s. I mean, this thing is all analog and it's got a cathode ray tube on the inside. You can really, really fine tune so many things beyond even what I know. So what I have here is it's, it's plugged in with banana plugs to an RCA adapter, which is then going to 3.5 millimeter to the Mother 32. So let's, let's put on the VCA mode. And right now it's on square wave. And you can see the square shape. So now, let's do sawtooth. It's very easy to see the sawtooth waveform, right? Now let's try white noise. And remember, white noise is a random waveform. So this is very random. Still cool to kind of see it this way, huh? We'll turn that off. But yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I kind of already adjusted things, so I didn't have to sit there tweaking everything just to get it right, just for this. But that's the tank in a nutshell. Um, it can do a, it can do a lot more, but uh, for the sake of the time of this video, I've cut it down to just show off a little bit of what it can do. And yeah. So we've made it to the end of the episode, guys, and I wanted to celebrate us reaching over a thousand subscribers. Thank you so much. I wanted to do a Q&A and answer some of the questions you guys had. So to start off, Jay Andrew asked, loved your videos. Thanks. I have a question. What got you into hardware synths in the first place and which synth was your very first? So that's a great question actually. Answer your second question first. My first synth was a Korg Electribe EMX1, I think was the model name. It was blue. I had been saving money forever. I got it when I was like 14 or something. Back when I was in high school, like a, a sophomore, I wanted an all-in-one synth. That's why I got that one. I wanted a groove box, something that I could 
make songs with, basically, because I didn't have the money to go out and buy a bunch of gear, so I wanted something that could kind of do it all for me. So that's what got me that first synth. What got me into synths, hardware synths in the first place? Well, it actually all started with software synths. My first DAW was Reason, and I got a little M-Audio keyboard controller, and I would try to make, like, synth wave, synth pop stuff on it, because I was really into a lot of the music of that time of, like, indie revival of, you know, synthesizer music, and so I was, I was really into that, and I really wanted to make some stuff myself. That's kind of where that foundation came from, so thanks for your question. Next question from Now Vu. What inspires you? Like, what inspires your composing and recordings? Does it come to you all at once or just a little at time? You know, honestly, it's a little bit of all of the above. I have uh, insomnia at night, and sometimes music is just flowing into my brain. But sometimes it comes when I hear another song and I'm like, I really like that rhythm. Or, hmm, I, I really like those pads from that synthesizer or whatever. And I'll try to take an element from a song that might inspire me to create my own. And I think that's totally okay. And that's how I've made some of my songs is by taking ideas from other artists or sometimes just messing around uh, with sequences or playing on the keyboard, uh, just random chords until I find something that I like. Sometimes I'll just sing something that comes to my mind and I'm like, I really like that. I'm gonna try to put that on the piano. Like I said, I can't always execute it, but if you guys are interested, I have released music under the name Tiger Arcade, big shocker. This started off as a music page act actually and I just wanted to continue doing music related stuff. Uh, but I released an entire album in uh, last year, and you can check that out. It's called Moonraker. I spent a lot of time working on that. I did everything, and I recorded all of the synthesizer using the Minilog XD. Uh, that was my only synthesizer at the time. I've, I've expanded and grown my collection a little bit since that time, but uh, I invite you to check that out, and I will leave a link for you guys to check that out. So let's go to the next question. From Lionheart Glassworks, he said, which DAW do you use? Have you considered doing tutorials? What is the electric, electronic music scene like in your area? Uh, let, me, let me take this one at a time. So uh, the DAW I use is Logic Pro X. I have downloaded a bunch of other trial versions of different uh, DAWs like Fruity Loops, Ableton, there's one other, I can't remember, but I started off using Reason if you didn't catch that. I like Logic because I started using GarageBand because it was free and then basically Logic Pro is like the upgraded version of GarageBand and so it was comfortable for me and uh, once I upgraded to Logic Pro, I just kind of started building more upon that. Have I considered doing tutorials? Absolutely. If that is something you guys are interested in, there's a lot of little tricks I know. Um, I'm not saying I'm an expert by any means, but there's a lot of things I know how to do. Uh, let, me get, let me know if you guys are interested in that. What is the electronic music scene like in your area? It doesn't exist. Again, I live in Wyoming, and Wyoming is the least populated state in the country. To give you an idea, uh, there's more animals here than there are people. It's mostly all country people, so I'm not from Wyoming. I've actually lived all over the country. I've lived overseas before. Uh, that, that's what we call it when we live outside of the U.S. I've lived in Italy. I've lived in Spain. I've lived on the east coast of the United States. I've lived on the west coast of the United States. Longest I've ever lived somewhere was in Arizona. I only moved here less than a year ago for work, so I'm not necessarily that Wyoming guy, right? I'm just I'm just here and I'm trying to make the most of it. How do you feel about soft synths as opposed to hardware synths? That's another great question. I actually prefer hardware synthesizers because I am way more of a hands-on person. I feel way more productive given knob twisting, using my fingers as opposed to moving a mouse around and clicking. I like to use a DAW and soft synths to build upon something that I've already made using hardware synths. 
that's my answer to that. Love your videos. Hope you're having a great day. You too, man. Appreciate you always commenting on my stuff. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> so Nat BVM also said, uh, what's the scene like? But he said Montana. Not a big deal. We're right next to each other. I'm actually in Wyoming. Um, there is no scene here. Again, it's like you might get some local guys playing guitar, some country music, but there's not really a... I mean, there's always a scene wherever you go, but it's. It, I wouldn't say it's what I'm used to and what I do. What are the good venues to play in, in the area? I mean, there's a bar. Uh, <laughs> there's a bar I could I could play at. Uh, other than that, God, there's there's really not much here. Are there house shows that you know of? No. What is the status of the live music scene? Are you beginning to play 10 live music this year? You know, he here's a confession. I've I've never played a live show under the name Tiger Arcade. I've put on little performances for fun with synthesizers in the past, but I've never done anything like with these legit songs that I've created. I really feel like it would take a band to put it on, but I might just be making an excuse for myself. But that's my answer to that. What's the best concert I've seen recently? <laughs> I haven't been to a concert in a long time. Really, I really haven't. It's It's been well over like six years since I've actually been to a concert. So, INN in you asked what are your biggest inspirations when it comes to electronic music so i have a confession to make i'm not an electronic music purist i don't just listen to electronic music uh, i listen to a lot of different genres of music actually to give you even more perspective i i don't just make electronic music uh, i have a drum kit i have a bass guitar an electric guitar an acoustic guitar yeah I, I enjoy making a lot of different styles but i do stay within the realm of synth pop dream pop uh psychedelic music those are kind of the fields of where i gain a lot of inspiration and because music to me is it's it's therapeutic it's an experience i want my music to take people to another place you know transport them almost and move them give them certain emotions and kind of be ear candy in, in in a way to describe it and that's what music is is for me and i want to project that to the listener as well i hope that answered your question in the vaguest of terms i don't have one specific artists that I gain inspiration from. Whoosh, my man. You, I always appreciate you commenting on my stuff. You basically ask, where did I learn Spanish? And what's the post process after I record audio? So to answer that second question, that might be one that I have to save for a video um, to kind of break that down, but it's, it's usually fine tuning, chopping up uh, audio, cleaning things up, mixing, and then mastering. I do everything myself, so, you know, it's not perfect what I do, but it gets the job done, I say. So I might have to save that question for another time. You also asked, how did I learn Spanish? Basically, I've lived in different places throughout my life. In the United States, I've lived in border, city, uh, in border states before, like Texas and Arizona, and I've been exposed to a lot of Spanish. I also worked abroad in Spain for a time, and so that's kind of where I got that full immersion, and I've just had a, a huge interest in it. I've, I've always had an interest in uh, languages and culture, and it all stemmed from growing up when uh, my father was military, and he got stationed in Italy, and so we spent uh, a couple of years there, and that's kind of where I got exposed to just a lot of different things, and it kind of opened my eyes to different things and languages and places beyond just the realm of the United States. And so I've just always had that interest and passion for that. So that's the, that's that question. Thanks again, man, for your questions. Let's go to the next one, David Pinto. So I'll translate what you said. Basically you said, which, in which portable instruments do you use and do you plan on doing some cool outdoor videos? I actually have thought a lot about doing that. I don't know if anyone would watch it. Uh, I have a lot of great scenery around here, but it's been six months of winter. And so I'm kind of limited to where I can go with all the snow everywhere. But I, ha I have been trying to build up a little portable arsenal and Candy Chords has also been helping me make some more things portable. But I have the Korg Vocal Modular, the Basil Castle Drum, 
pocket operator and I'd like to make some other stuff more portable. I just don't have a portable recorder yet. Other than a little tape recorder, which might work, but um, obviously it's a different type of uh, saturated audio. Thanks for your question. Let's go to the next one. Someone asked me, how do you find time to make such cool music? Uh, I appreciate that. Like I said before, I am married and I have kids and I have a full-time job. So I'm trying to make time for my, my passion of music, but I'm grateful to my family for giving me time. I'm just as passionate about my family as I am about music. And so it's finding a balance, creating a schedule at a time that's appropriate and sometimes making adjustments when necessary because having a family, there's a lot of unpredictable things in it. So I'm grateful to my wife and my kids for their patience <laughs> and putting up with me. But guys, I think I think that's, that's it for today with questions. I just again want to thank you all for your support and helping our, our community grow beyond a thousand. And I don't plan on stopping there. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm passionate about this. I love doing it. And so I just kind of took a, a, a chance one day, like, what if I started sharing and talking about it? I don't know. If I could help one person or one person of interest, you know, that's awesome. And I started making a lot of friends along the way. And I was like, this is great. There's a huge community. I don't feel so alone anymore. And so I love doing this. I have so many ideas coming up. I'm always open to, to hear what you guys have, what questions you have. Guys, just remember, music should be fun. It's therapeutic for me as well as it is fun. And just don't forget that as, as you make it. Don't overcomplicate it, okay? And we'll end on that note. And until then, we'll see you next time. Peace.